And I've got clients who have built multi-million dollar businesses who've become estranged from family members yeah. and friends. Mm. And I think there's this misconception with the likes of tall poppy syndrome or this kind of envy that it's just strangers and people don't know you. Mm. But actually, it kind it's kind of just an offshoot of the alienation that people can experience when they try to do something that's different. Good morning and welcome to another edition of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I'm super excited to be joined by Lani Fogelberg, who um, I have known for a long, long time online, but never actually got to meet in person. And so we're finally in studio together and really looking forward to having her talk. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Deborah. I, well, like I said when I arrived, I'm thrilled to be here and finally meet you face to face as well. Yeah, it's been really good. We've had a great chat in the, in the boardroom before we actually came in here. So Lani is a management and strategy consultant. If you have been on social media anywhere, I'm sure you will have seen her. She's also a, a big car lover as well. I think that's probably what first attracted me to her, if I'm honest. Um, being a bit of a Ferrari girl myself, when I saw Ferrari, I was like, well, who is this lady? I've got to find out who she is. <laughs> so, Lani, tell us a little bit about your journey to where you are now today and share with us, you know, what you're proud of in that journey so far. Yeah, it's, it's been a really interesting one. I, I think oh, a couple of things I'm the most proud of, I suppose, of to reverse engineer the story is the, the life that I've built for myself, which is one that I really enjoy. Hmm which I think a lot of people forget to place due importance on. And also the meaningful contributions that I've been able to make to people's lives throughout that journey, which has largely been in the financial services space. So that's kind of where I was uh, on the tools or learned my craft, I suppose, and spent time running an Australian business for a large aggregator over there. Mm -hmm. And that was back in 2012 and 2013, right up until 2019. So that's sort of where my journey began, I suppose. Um, it's really weird to think that that's actually 10 years ago, <laughs> more than 10 years ago now, <laughs> 11. But when I exited that business, a lot of people asked me to do some consulting. And so that's how Fogelberg Consulting was born. And that's essentially what I've done throughout the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, that point of pride that I mentioned is around being able to support people through those difficult times. Yeah, there was some really tough times yeah. over here, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I think that people, it was, it was um, for most, it was the first time they've been through anything like mm. that as well. Mm. Yeah. And it was so, we're so used to COVID now in the sense that it's not new to us anymore. Mm -hmm. But when we think back to the sheer uncertainty yes. of 2020, so being able to, being in a position to be able to sort of, even though I didn't necessarily have a plan myself, but to support people through that was mm. Very rewarding in yeah. a strange way, I suppose. <laughs> Excellent. <Yeah. laughs> so I'm going to just I'm going to ask a little bit about the cars first because I can't, I can't help myself. It's like you know, you, well, as soon as I knew you had a Ferrari, it's like, oh my goodness. Um, so tell us tell us about your love of cars. Tell me where that came from, and tell me a little bit about the cars you've got at the moment. Yes, it definitely came from my dear dad. So there are some photos I've shared previously online of me, like in the passenger seat of his Triumph TR6 when I was three or four years old. <laughs> so he was a classic car lover. I spent yep. many many fond childhood afternoons at Pukekohe Park Raceway which of course was kind of decommissioned um, in March this year and it really just grew I suppose from those great family memories of spending time with mum and dad and my brother yeah. very small family at the racetrack and then as I got older uh, gosh you know there was a guy who lived down the bottom of our street who built kit set for GT40s and so that car would sometimes drive past which was a, a no exit street and I'd just be like what is that <laughs> <laughs> and you know when I was kind of 12 13 14 and it just grew from there yeah and then I was exposed to some of the charity work that the Ferrari Owners Club does through a colleague that my father worked with and I ended up going out to one of their charity events as a 14 or 15 year old very impressionable <laughs> very very impressionable at that age I not only saw like these kids who were sick come in from these hot laps just beaming and so happy, <laughs> but I also had a couple of laps myself. And I think if you have that, you just get addicted. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, this is amazing. Like yeah. this is something that you can actually do in life. Um, yeah. So I, I vowed that I would buy a Ferrari one day. <laughs> so come oh, 2017, um, it, I'd, I'd had the means to for a while and 
yeah, decided to push the button on it. Now, we were talking about this earlier, and we've got similar stories. My father was a big car nut as well, yeah. and he actually used to come back from the shows, uh, the car shows over in Europe and back to the UK and bring us little car models and photos of the latest um, Porsches and, and, yeah. and Ferraris and things. That's when I first vowed I would have one. And, in fact, I had a photo of a Ferrari on my wall forever growing up. That's what I was going to have. I haven't quite made it yet, but I'm going to get there one day. But you were saying that it has changed. It changes the way people treat you in some respects is that true overnight yeah yeah overnight and it's I think because it's a very it's a very out there thing people can you know it's it's see touch feel Mm -hmm. people can see it whereas the professional accomplishments that have led you to have the financial means to spend your money in that way Mm -hmm. um aren't as easily seen yep and so I don't know. And there's just this negative connotation, I think. And with Ferrari as a brand specifically, yeah. you mentioned earlier about some of the other cars I've got. I bought a McLaren six months ago, mm-hmm. which is newer, more expensive, <laughs> bigger, sparkly. <laughs> <laughs> Arguably, it, it, it's, it's an, a, more, a, a more radical looking car. Yep. Um, I don't get any kind of like verbal abuse driving that mm. whatsoever. I get like thumbs up. It, it's bizarre. But the Ferrari just has this like negative connotation people will strangers will seemingly hate you yeah because of a car that you have it's it's bizarre and especially I guess when you've grown up really loving cars and cars have never had any kind of negative connotation attached to them so yeah that's been an interesting one I used to have a lovely Porsche as well Mm -hmm. which I uh, sold a couple of months ago because the McLaren essentially replaced it but I did own them at the same time which is very silly and naughty of me but anyway um, life's, life's for living isn't it I know, exactly. <laughs> yeah. it was absurd that it was in storage for the last six months that I owned it because I didn't have anywhere to put it right but um my coolest car is actually a 1993 BMW M3 ah. so for any true enthusiasts watching yes. or listening to this episode they like their heart will be racing <laughs> now because that is like that is a true enthusiast car right so yeah. that's a very very special car to me um yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, just see if I can find some pictures. But um, and I suppose it was that sort of the um, critiquing that you got from people about that car that actually made you want to stand up and sort of and, and bring that to people's attention. Is that, like you said, in order to have the means to buy that car, you worked really hard mm-hmm. and you probably were very, you know, very good with your savings. You were mm-hmm. making sure you're very frugal. Um, and yet people see it as a negative as opposed to a positive. And that happens a lot here in New Zealand, doesn't it? It, it really does. And it's, and then again, it just comes back to me that I don't understand it because I've never had that kind of mentality mm-hmm. whenever you see someone who has something and it could be an expensive handbag or I kind of you know beautiful diamond jewelry or you know, I'm trying to think of other examples but yep. I'm, I'm actually struggling to come up with them you kind of think like oh my goodness isn't that beautiful isn't that lovely yes and so I think it's it's a very difficult thing to understand when you can't imagine taking such a judgmental stance about anyone else or anything Mm -hmm. um but what it's really highlighted to me is this kind of underbelly or like this dark side that we do have you know down under I'd say it's an ANZ thing yep uh it exists around the world right envy exists (laughs) it's a human emotion (laughs) yes for whatever reason it's it's particularly prominent down here Mm. and it's really made me want to I spoke earlier about changing the culture, you know, with you out in the boardroom, but it's really made me want to bolster people against those kinds of judgments because they are so prevalent. I don't know whether there's anything that I can do to change them, but I think it's really, really important that we do prepare people that if they are going to hang around and try to do something cool in New Zealand that, hey, this unfortunately can happen. So what probably will happen. Yeah. Yeah. So what can we do to actually support you to, to deal with that. Mm-hmm. Mm. So you do a lot of work with actually making sure people are mentally strong enough to yeah. deal with some of those things that are going to be, um, be happening to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. And I've got clients who have built multi-million dollar businesses who've become estranged from family members yeah. and friends. Mm. And I think there's this misconception with the likes of tall poppy syndrome or this kind of envy that it's just strangers and people don't know you. Mm. But actually it kind it's kind of just an offshoot of the alienation that people can experience when they 
try to do something that's different. Yeah. Well, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, we didn't we talked a little bit about this before as well, but you know, the whole condition that we have as we grow up and what's expected of us and we we live our life trying to be what we think we should be as opposed to just mm. actually enjoying it. And we were only here once. Mm. Uh, maybe maybe more times, who knows? But yeah, but <laughs> this this time we're here and um, you know, we've got to make the most of it, which is why uh, I think you and I share a similar passion. It's like actually making sure you're doing what you love with people you love, yeah. making a difference, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and yeah, okay. Mm. And you talked about the fact that, that, you know, this is actually encouraging some of our young people to actually move away too, right? So in the country, we, we're potentially losing great young people because they um, are, well, first of all, they might be finding it a bit difficult over here, but then also they're, they're not celebrated if they, if they, do, if they are mm. successful. Uh, tell me a bit more about that. And, it's, and you mentioned the word celebrated as well. Mm. And I'm very much of the opinion that we don't necessarily need to celebrate success because I think that's, you know, you could, you could argue that that's being... Greedy is not the right word. Um, but just to not crap on it would be a really good start. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Celebrating is kind of like, I mean, yeah, well, absolutely, we should celebrate the successes that we see around us. Yeah. If, you know, our partner achieves something or one of our friends achieves something, yeah, it's great to celebrate that. But at a more macro level, I think just changing the narrative to not crap on people that have gone out and often taking big risks Mm -hmm. um to to do something would be a really really good start and it's not even just my observations or my perception or my opinion about what happens this is like anecdotally been proven to me hundreds if not thousands of times when I kind of inadvertently spoke up about tall poppy syndrome in the media for example I had about 3,000 messages and there were parents, teachers, and people in the sporting world who all shared stories with me about what they've done, what happened to their child, uh, to their child, what they've experienced in the industry, or why they left, yeah, or why they came back and they left again. Hmm. So this is not just an opinion from some chick <laughs> who's like, yeah, thought this or experienced it herself. But there's just so much anecdotal evidence out there to yeah confirm that mm. so I mean how do you help people with that because uh, yes it exists we can't pretend it doesn't yeah. so what, what do you how do you see us as as a whole being able to help with that and what can we do it's a very big question mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very big question I spoke about this at the M2 summit last year I, I didn't speak about it sorry I touched on it yep. um that presentation was essentially how making high performance is accessible to as many people as possible was crucial for our social, economic and environmental future in New Zealand. And one of the points that I touched on, particularly around the social aspect, was the narrative that we typically see in what I call our most prolific information sources. This also came up in many conversations I had off the back of a, another presentation I delivered last week with, the, with a, a group of CFOs and senior finance leaders. And it was around essentially the media. Mm -hmm. And the morning I delivered this presentation last week, I actually jumped onto the news, which I don't typically do, but I wanted to say, have some anecdotal stuff. And the first six headlines all had these terribly negative words in them, like stoush and like bogus or like all of these very negative words. And we kind of see that. And what are our conversations comprised of? What is the stuff that we see on social media comprised of? It's it's largely opinions that people have formed from consuming this information. Mm -hmm. So I do think that we collectively, one of the big things that we can do is actually call it out when we see it. Yeah. And Sir Ray Avery mentioned this in a video that he did recently with the common room. Collectively, what can we do? Yep. We need to call it out when we see it, yep. especially when it's coming from the media. I could go into that so much. <laughs> no, I was just thinking about, I, I mean, I, I actually stopped watching the news about 10 years ago. Yeah. I decided it was yeah, it was like not us. a great thing to be doing for myself. And yeah. and I believe that um, I don't want to be uninformed, but I only want to be informed about things I can make a difference on. Yeah. There's some things we can't affect. So that was, yeah, and they're very negative. And I, I believe now with the current, you know, um, economic downturn, recession, I, I, I'm traveling a lot at the moment and I'm seeing in different countries different ways that they're dealing with it. We are so negative. We're almost talking ourselves into a massive recession when the rest of the world is actually going well that's phew, that's over and done with and how do we move we forward are. did you see the post i made about the overheads motorway sign in melbourne a few months no ago? no i missed that no because i know that you obviously have spent a lot of time in australia yes australia. <laughs> <laughs> and i was on the way 
from the airport. Oh, it was a positive to, reinforcement as opposed. Yep, yeah, 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 so, yeah. Please share it. Yeah, on the way from the airport, I, I like I'd arrived on a Sunday because. Um, Long story. Anyway, I'd arrived on a Sunday, so I was yep. cruising. And a uh, beautiful sunny day. I walked out of the airport, and there's this, like, beautiful warm air. Got into this Uber on my way to the hotel, and a few kilometres from the airport, there was one of those illuminated overhead signs with text on it. And yep. it said, um, incident, three kilometres ahead, merge right or, or left or whatever. Yep. And in that moment, I just thought, oh, my God. Does this not just perfectly summarise the difference in sentiment between a place like Melbourne or Australia versus New Zealand at the moment? Because if that sign was in Auckland, it would say, incident ahead, lane blocked. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're not too right. Yeah. <laughs> it perfectly sums, I, I could not, I, it was just this penny drop moment. I could not believe how perfectly it summed up that difference in sentiment. Mm -hmm. Can do versus no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Computer says no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Oh, uh, yeah. Goodness. No, and I, we do say a lot, and I do. I honestly do believe that our media has a huge part to play in this because yeah. they they can actually change the narrative there, and, and that's oh. what people are listening to, looking and at every day. Setting aside the fact that the very definition of an economic recession is GDP going backwards two quarters in a row, mm -hmm. our GDP went backwards five point six percent in the quarter to the end of December twenty twenty two. Yep. So the media is like the recession's coming up. You know, everyone batting down the hatches or whatever. Mate, this is like nine months ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, we started going into recession like last year. Yes. Here with the program. Yeah, like, yeah. How, how, are we, how are we getting out of it? How are we going to get the GDP back up? That's right. Yeah, focus oh. on what we can do as opposed to what's the past. Yeah. I mean, you would do a lot of this work with your companies that you work with as well. It's like, you know, it's we've got to have lagging indicators so we can actually see what's going on. We're really looking for forward and going, well, actually, what can we do to move the needle? Yeah. How do we actually change yeah. it going forward as opposed to worrying yeah. about what's happened? And the worst thing is we're, you know, we're in an election year as well, right? Yes. So <laughs> the, the dialogue is all about who's the best and who did what and yes. pointing fingers and all of that yep. as opposed to actually getting shit done. Get shit done. I said Sorry. I wouldn't swear on that. And no, it's, it's perfectly yeah. fine. Everyone knows, every know, who knows me knows, knows <laughs> I swear. Okay, so that that, that whole um, high performance thing is really, really important. What about resilience? Is that part of yeah. it as well? Yeah, so that, that's, and this is kind of like I've got two missions, right? So yep. I've got my entrepreneurial mission, which mm -hmm. is to make, uh, I call it relative high performance because it's, you know, performance is relative to where someone's at, right? Sure. So, but making a higher level of performance accessible to as many business owners across Australia and New Zealand as possible so that we can get those kind of more nerdy outcomes, I suppose, that I'm driven by, which is essentially a greater level of productivity yep. so that we can see a better country. Mm -hmm. um, because obviously we're seeing the detriment of poor productivity at the moment yeah. with, you know, low wage growth, expensive cheese, um, <laughs> Yep. Um, so that's like my entrepreneurial mission and you know we'll, we'll obviously talk about that later but the my personal mission is going back to that first point of pride I mentioned I'm very proud about the life I've crafted for myself and the yep. fact that I've got a very fulfilling enjoyable life which is conducive to the way that I want to live and it feels bloody good and I want other people to feel that way too <laughs> yep. because life is too short yes like you said so how do we do that well we build confidence in ourselves to take the action that we know that we want to take in here, yep. but that isn't necessarily the norm. Um, yeah. And by bolstering ourselves against the barriers that we will invariably encounter because life is life. Yeah. So I do think that resilience is extremely important. Uh, extremely important. Yeah. yeah. I think we share similar kind of um, yeah, yeah. passions and beliefs. Mm. And I think, I mean, I, I always laugh because um, we, we we live just next to the park, Western Park, and when we go for a walk in the mornings, they've got this beautiful playground, but it has all that rubbery stuff underneath oh, yes. the swings and the slides <laughs> and things. And I kind of go, that's really nice because it feels really nice to walk on. Um, but it's kind of, it, it takes away consequence. And I do wonder, because, <laughs> you know, I, when I was a child, if you fell off a swing or, or, or a slide because you were doing something stupid because you generally don't fall yeah. off slides and swings if you're doing the right yeah. thing if you fell off because you're doing something stupid you generally broke an arm or a leg yeah. and then you kind of went okay that wasn't a good idea I won't do it again yeah. whereas now I feel like we're kind of wrapping everything in cotton wool and making it almost impossible to fail and I, I know I know from a more personal experience business-wise I've had two spectacular failures um, that have cost me everything mm -hmm. and I learned more from that than the successes I've had because I've also had some great success yeah. as well so I think it's important that actually you've got to be, resilience will right. help you and you only build resilience by actually experiencing and learning how to cope with those things. Yeah, it's like a muscle. Yeah. 
That's exactly right. Yeah. I think that's why um, as we get older, we become more resilient as well because we just, we've just had more practice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. <laughs> oh, cool. So going back to your business stuff then. So, you know, what 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 motivates you? What drives you? Why are you so passionate? I mean, I, I hear you, but why are you yeah. so passionate about what you're doing? There, I mean, you know, there's there are definitely some selfish reasons why I'm so passionate. So I just, since I was a little girl, I have just been so driven by learning, I suppose. Mm-hmm. I love just taking on new information. Yeah, ever, ever, ever since I was very, very small. And so doing what I do, it, I find it incredibly satisfying from that point of view because I'm constantly learning. Yep. I'm constantly taking on new concepts, um, solving problems. I just enjoy that. So there's definitely a selfish aspect to what I do. I yep. just enjoy solving these giant adult-sized jigsaw puzzles. <laughs> That's kind of the way that I describe it. Or logic problems. Yep. Um, I mean, God, if you told 10-year-old Lani that, oh, you can you can have make an entire career out of just like, you know these little logic problems books that you do? Yeah, yeah. you just do those but bigger. <laughs> I would have been like, wow. Yeah, that's what I want to yeah, be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there, you know, there's that. And, and I think it's it's um, when when you do enjoy something, it's very easy to be, uh, to cultivate cultivate the discipline to do the things that you need to do when you're not otherwise motivated, right? Yep. Um, or tired or sick or whatever. So there's that. Um, secondary to that, I do think I was put on this earth for a reason. Yeah. Um, I, I do think our responsibility as humans is to enjoy life, not necessarily to accomplish things, but I do feel like I was put here to create some value mm-hmm. and leave a bit of a legacy, I suppose. And when I look at the way that our country has become, you know, we're not really this great nation anymore. Mm-hmm. Like we're really lagging behind the rest of the OECD on many, many fronts. And it's quite sad. Yeah. And, I really would like that to be better. <laughs> like I grew up here. Yeah. My parents grew up here. Hopefully my children will grow up here. And so if there's something that I can do which is going to have a tiny, tiny, tiny positive impact on that, to me that's hugely motivating. Mm. Um, a friend once asked me what makes me happy and I said making other people happy. And he was like, no, it can't be fair. <laughs> that's bullshit. And I'm like, no. Mm. The genuine satisfaction that I get from, I mean, especially in 2020, my goodness, mm you know, ensuring that people's livelihoods remain viable. Um, they're, they're, I think we're just intrinsically wired as humans to derive satisfaction from that. So, yeah, yeah there's a, a big motivating factor for me to just have an impact. Yeah. Sounds terribly cliche. No, well, no, I'm, I'm sitting here and I think, you know, I'm obviously quite a bit older than you, but yeah, we, we share the same passion. I mean, yeah, part of yeah. me is I'm not from New Zealand, yeah. but this is now my home. Mm. And I'm really disappointed as a country because I think it's a beautiful country. There's yeah. huge potential. And I just see it going backwards. And yeah. my, my dream is, again, to leave the, the earth probably a bit earlier than you, but in, in a better position than when I came into yeah. it. And I, and I derive huge pleasure out of helping people. Yeah. Um, and I just seeing them succeed. And, and, you know, my story, I'm driven a bit by the fact that I don't want anybody to not spend the time doing the stuff that they love with the people they love because yeah. life is too just too yeah. short it, yeah. it's fleeting yeah it's fleeting and I had some lessons um, about that when I was very very young I experienced some <clears throat> I wouldn't say traumatic events I feel like the word trauma is overused now but mm. um like yeah a relative of mine was killed in a train crash when I was no, 10 no. and I witnessed a fatal accident when I was 14 wow. and I feel like yeah those kinds of things they they do stay with you in mm-hmm. the sense of the it's this immense kind of perspective that you get in your formative years. Yeah. So I think that has kind of, that that definitely has given me, I suppose, this zest <laughs> for life and appreciation for how short it is yep. and how we must make the most of it as such. Hmm. Um, I just want a little note here. You talked about jigsaw puzzles and adult jigsaw yeah. puzzles. Are we talking about normalising certain behaviours and things? I think it's really interesting. When I was growing up, I was a real geek. Like I was always <laughs> top of the class. I was naughty um, because I got bored in class and so I was often um, also the naughtiest and the one that was stuck in the corner with you know to behave. But um, I used to love things like jigsaw puzzles. And as I got older and I wanted to be part of the in crowd, they took the mickey out of me for me loving these things. So I actually kind of pushed it aside and went, oh, can't do jigsaw puzzles because they're, they're just geeky and nobody does that and then as an adult I remember sharing I was doing a jigsaw puzzle at home on my own I remember sharing it on Facebook and people always friends of mine went we love our jigsaw puzzles I thought 
it's okay to do jigsaw puzzles. Yeah. I really had no idea. <laughs> and it's a very simplistic um, version of how we kind of get brought up with things that people tell us we ought to, should do, or, you know, all these kind of c- constrictions yeah. around what is right and what is wrong and what oh. we should do. And I'm guessing you must see a lot of that in business as well. Oh, to- totally. Like life and business. Mm-hmm. I did a podcast episode in 2020 called Adulting is a Fallacy. <laughs> and I can't remember. It was, I had a subtitle as well. But yeah. I think I mentioned how sometimes I've got like hundreds and thousands on my breakfast because I like, I want to. Yes. <laughs> Why and, not? Yeah, and they're yeah. pretty. Yeah. So I don't care if it's not appropriate for some of my age. And I, I do think that, yeah, personally and professionally, it's probably a slightly different conversation, right? Because mm-hmm. there there is an element of appropriateness that is certainly required in a professional context. Um, but with the way that our lives and our professional lives now blend together, I do like how we're starting to see this much more human yeah. element come into our professional lives and that appreciation for the fact that, well, actually, when I go home, I am just another human in my dreams or whatever. That's, yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I, I quite like that. And mm-hmm. I, I think that's probably one of the reasons why I uh, am so open and authentic online as well. Setting yeah. aside the fact it would just be too much effort to do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> to try and be something that you're not, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think the sooner we actually learn that, the better. I wish I'd learned it a whole lot earlier because mm-hmm. I think um, Gino Wickman, who wrote the kind of the traction book and the stuff that I teach in EOS, he actually talked about the fact that if we're always trying to be something different for different people, it's a huge amount of energy we yeah. have to use to do that. Yeah. And he talked about the fact when he had his 30th birthday party, his wife organised a surprise 30th yeah. birthday for him and he had friends, he had family, he had colleagues, he had work people and they all knew different versions of Gina. Yeah. And so he literally arrived and first of all, he was like excited. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Then it was yeah. like, ah. Oh, but who am I supposed to be yeah. with all these different groups of people? And that was his like aha moment of like, mm. actually, if I was just myself and more authentic all the time, it's a it's a huge, uh, it's less energy wasted on things yeah. that are not important. Yeah, that was me in my early twenties though. I yeah, had, like, well, lucky you. Yeah, and out of work planning. Right? Yes, it's like. I don't know that I party. <laughs> or or yeah. things like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even yeah. at this, uh, this presentation last week, which I, I think is about 300 people all up, uh, largely over Zoom with like 50 or 60 people in the room. And yep. I don't know if it was just in my head. <laughs> I actually need to watch it. But I'm pretty sure I said, um, you know, in that, in that presentation, I mentioned something about not using perfectly crafted professional photos of myself because I wanted to make this a very human presentation. Yep. And um, the point I mentioned was that, like, yeah, earlier today I ate a bagel sitting on the floor of my lounge with my cat next to me in the sunshine. Yes. It doesn't make me any less intelligent or capable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, so yeah. I, I just think that it's, it's really important um, and that that can also be quite a little bit of a balm on some of the well-being issues that we are starting to see mm. kind of as a result of the modern world and all of the crazy things that have gone on yeah. in recent years. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. my, my niece over in Australia, I was saying to you, she's 16 <laughs> years old, um, they're, they're – they live a lot of their, their time online in the social world. And I think I try to be reasonably authentic online. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to tell you about every single down moment that I have because yeah. nobody's going to want to hear all of that stuff, right? <laughs> so you're, you're going to get more positive than you are negative. Yeah. And that probably is actually quite a genuine reflection of my life because I'm mostly pretty positive. Um, but they have this almost unrealistic kind of mm. an understanding of what they should look like, how they should behave, oh, they what, should look like what people live gosh. like, you know? Yeah. yeah, the looking like thing is scary. That freaks me out, yeah. 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 Um, People are turning into clones with all this like cosmetic work. I know. It is, it's quite hilarious, isn't it? You can look at them and they're all the same. But anyway, <laughs> Stepford Wives, I would call them. But <laughs> the filters. The filters. Yeah. Oh, the filters. Oh, oh. I tell you what, I, 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 people actually use filters sometimes on their LinkedIn profiles. You kind of think, what must it be like? So you've been engaging with this person online for a period of time and you finally get to meet them and they're completely different. <laughs> oh, look, you've got small eyes. I thought you had massive eyes because all your oh, visuals. <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> How about that? That, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Dear. Okay, so um, <laughs> we, we, could, we, could, we could get easily distracted in this, couldn't oh, we? <laughs> <sorry. Yeah. laughs> so back to business. Um, we, you know, we, we've actually we've already been talking for well over half an hour. So if you had to give kind of three really top business tips, what have you learned? Because you've you have grown and managed a large a large business. You've worked with business owners, multi million dollar businesses. What would be the three kind of top things that you would say you'd like to share? I actually wrote some notes on this because when I got your podcast, babe, I (laughs) I don't like having conversations and then not making, like, they're not being really genuine value for people taking their time to listen. Yep. Um, And uh, this this is kind of on theme with what we've been speaking about, but um, 
doing the work to become the person that you need to be to achieve the things that you want to achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's some big gaps that I see there from yep. time to time. And then as you see that gap close, suddenly like you see the goals getting ticked off. Yep. And whether that's people learning to you know, pr- practice at making faster decisions, yep. you know, something crucial mm-hmm. in business, especially as you are building, a, like if you're building a, a fast growing business. Yep. Um, and then, you know, on the flip side, maybe the more kind of personal side, recognizing the alienation that can potentially come in an entrepreneurial journey yes. or in a business journey and doing what you need to do to kind of prepare yourself for that and cultivating the conviction that you need to hold within yourself to, you know, help you stay connected to what you're trying to achieve when you've got kind of naysayers or, or <laughs> otherwise coming up in front of you. So. Yeah, becoming, working out what you need to do. Who who do you need to be to achieve the things that you want to achieve? Yep. So important in business, especially if your mother-in-law is going to alienate you or, or whatever, you know, <laughs> yes, it, it yeah. happens and it's 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 awful, but it's kind of like the compromise, right? It's mm-hmm. like the price that you pay for succeeding um, in many cases. Um, looking at something that's a little bit more tangible, having a plan to plan, having structure to actually your strategic priorities in business. Mm -hmm. This is going like right down the other end of the spectrum to to the first point that I made, but that kind of underpins my work is why are we in business? What are we doing? And then how do we translate that into what we're doing this week, this month, this quarter, this year? Right size chunks that actually be done and and all lead back to that ultimate end goal. It sounds, it sounds simple. Yeah. And it is, but it's not easy. (laughs) I'm going to say, I always say this about EOS. I mean, the the stuff that I teach with the, the, you know, the slightly larger leadership teams and things is like, it's, it is really, really simple, but it is not easy. Yeah. It takes commitment. It takes consistency. It takes clarity. And yeah. you see it going wrong as well. Like, you know, people think, oh, we need to establish an advisory panel, whether, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's formalized or not, whether, yep. whether it's a board or not. Um, but it's very easy for them to be actually counterproductive or dysfunctional. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so making sure that, okay, yes, you create some structure actually to what you're doing in business, but making sure that it's productive, mm-hmm. it's not cumbersome. Yep. <laughs> it's yep. not actually going to prevent you from doing the do. Mm. Um, or stop you from making decisions. I think sometimes, oh. I remember I used to work at the Ice House with a lot of the startup businesses, you know, they, they were, had so yeah. many advisors yeah. who were advisors, not not coaches, so therefore they were given their opinions yeah. and then suddenly they get very confused they've got all these opposing com- yeah. opinions and you had to say to them, well, they're just opinions yeah. um, and the only person who can really make the decision is going to mm. be you. Mm. But So take mm. all those opinions, mm. make what you want of them and then make a decision. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, one of my favourite projects is with a rapidly growing business in Australia and over the past 18 months or so that we've been working together like he's now got such a great team around him of advisors but we all work very collaboratively Mm -hmm. and so it just means that he can focus on doing what he needs to do and he knows that he's kind of got people that will look after him if that makes sense yes and that's where it really really works Mm. because you know that the wheels are going to keep turning yeah you're not putting something in place which is actually prohibitive <laughs> to achieving <laughs> yep. what you need to achieve. And and I think in a post-COVID environment as well, that's what a lot of businesses need. They need a path to move down. Yep. They yep. need instructions, right? Yep. Um, and if you can do that, even, even if you're a solopreneur, mm. even if you are operating by yourself and you don't have people working for you, at least not full-time, you know, it's very hard to be the dictator and the slave, as I say. So you kind of need that that structure or those constraints yep. um, so that you know what you're doing when you get up in the morning. Yep. That's actually going to move the needle closer to where you want to be. Mm. Um, I, I get right there down to my I have a uniform. Um, people always say to me, you've always looked sort of, you know, glamorous and you've always got a dress and you've always got your... I actually wear the same jewellery every single day to work. I have yeah. a number of dresses. I can just pull one out of the cupboard in the morning. No decisions made. Yeah. And I think as an entrepreneur, we have enough decisions to make every single day without thinking about it. <laughs> Plus it gives me a chance to go right uniform into that state, into that frame of mind when I get home out of that uniform different state different state yep. of mind yeah yep. it's hugely important mm. and it's yes yeah, it's structure, structure. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. yeah yeah um and the other thing as well which I think has just come up for me a lot lately in my work with companies is um facing the things that you might be a little bit scared of <laughs> <laughs> and so I feel the fear and do it anyway I, I think about like a new system that I helped implement into a company recently which is very much in its infancy uh the the system not the company yep and um everyone was so scared of it mm. I was like come on come on look at what this is going to give you yeah <laughs> and now they all love it yeah. <laughs> and so that I mean that's a very like vanilla kind of example but um one of the pitfalls that I saw during COVID was um, 
people not really having financial empowerment over the business. Mm-hmm. Like you could be turning over twenty million dollars, but yeah, okay, show me your cash flows. Yeah, yeah. Like show me, like show me your plan. Um, and a lot of people don't do it just because it's scary or because it's unfamiliar. Mm-hmm. And so it's yeah. In my observations over the last few years, being able to confront what makes you feel uncomfortable or incompetent mm-hmm. or uncertain yes. is actually the stuff that you need to confront. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hence my elephants everywhere. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's like, what is it we're all ignoring in this I room? that we? The <laughs> yeah. I love the elephants. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I'm the later one to bring the elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, look, we could talk all day, but we don't yeah. have all the time in the world. We've already had a great big long chat in, there in the <laughs> workshop. Um, tell me a little about, you know, who do you really love working with? What is your ideal client? Why would they work with you and, and and who would you choose? Yeah, I'll probably start with the why, if I'm yeah, honest. So sure. I, I suppose I bring a bit of a, not a unique value proposition, but a rare value proposition in the sense that I essentially come in as a management consultant. So mm-hmm. Lani from Fogelberg Consulting yeah. um, to hold companies accountable to their strategic objectives, but actually help them determine what they should be and what the action steps are to achieve them in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that's something that generally doesn't get paired with that ongoing accountability. Normally you get like a management consultant from one of the big four. They'll pull out their strategy. They'll put it in front of you and say, this is what you need to do. Goodbye. Lovely seeing you. Thanks for the chat. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. I guess you're working like closely with an implementation team, right? But then you kind of potentially get yourself into a a situation um, where you've got like management consultants running your business and they're just looking to deploy more people and find more problems. Yep. <laughs> so my model is very much um, in a one-on-one setting, let's work out what are we doing here, what do we actually need to do mm-hmm. um, and help them work out what that action plan is and then hold them accountable to that action plan and provide ongoing operational advice. Yep. So it's, it's really getting into the nitty-gritty of the business. Yep. Um, and, you know, that CRM system that I mentioned earlier just as an example, with that business alone in the last few months, like we've overhauled their business continuity plan. Um, we've, you know, done other things within the business, which I won't go into now, but things that are actually quite fundamentally important mm-hmm. that, yeah, you can't just get any old Tom, Dick or Harry in or like a typical business coach to come and do it because they don't have the technical technical expertise. Yeah. So that's where I fit into the picture. Um, so you're, you're a management consultant yeah. who has got the ability to do the strategy and the operational, but also to work alongside with them to make sure it actually gets done. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it's not meaningful to me if it doesn't get done. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Yep. So going back to the selfish bit, <laughs> yeah. um, it's not meaningful to me if it if it doesn't actually happen. And um, and again, with more of that consulting flavor, I will go away and research things that need to be researched as well, which often businesses la- actually lack the resource to do, or the resource doesn't actually have the analytical ability to understand what uh, how that how the results of that research would be applied in a commercial environment mm-hmm. um, for a tangible commercial outcome. So that's the kind of stuff that, that I get into. Yep. And that's normally in a one-on-one context Yep. Um, or one-on leadership team context. Yes. And my ideal client, it's a value system, baby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, we talked about this. Yeah, we, so they've yeah. got to be ambitious. There's got to be a genuine desire to improve, to be better, to grow Mm -hmm. they've got to be coachable they've got to be prepared to listen to (laughs) me (laughs) which not everyone's prepared to do yep sometimes they think they are Mm -hmm. and they're really not yeah um it's kind of like the idea the idea is nice but the reality is not so different because they have to do all those uncomfortable things um and people that operate with a high level of of integrity Mm. so and my experience lends itself to blokey businesses yeah so manufacturing construction all the fun stuff wonderful and um yeah that's typically where i sit Fantastic. Mm. So if people want to get hold of you, how do they get hold of you, Lani? I'm very easily stalkable with an name yeah. like Lani Fogelberg. So <laughs> yeah. you punch Lani F into LinkedIn and I will probably come up if you're in New Zealand or Australia. <laughs> okay. um, that's that's typically the easiest way to get hold of me. Absolutely. Hey, look, we've had a great chat before we came in here, another great chat in here. Um, looking forward to doing some more work together and thank you very much for giving us your time. Thank you for having me, Deborah. Absolute pleasure. Mm-hmm.